Most of us are fumbling and bumbling with the camera when the adventure starts, when the subject starts to sparkle in front of you and you know that that's the right time to take the picture. You're still struggling with the camera, trying to get it in focus, trying to get the aperture right. That's wrong. You've got to go in the backyard every day and practice, practice, practice until you can use that camera very quickly without looking at it. Only then can you arrive at the proper decisive moment in your photography. Only then can you produce a worthwhile photograph. But it's up to you. This is self-talk. I want to give you the passion. I want to give you the permission to strike out on your own and get the best photographs you've ever seen, to dig down in your heart and pull them out by yourself. Study, study, study. Practice, practice, practice. And I guarantee you'll do it. You'll get it. And then maybe you'll call me up and thank me for it. We can be buddies. Let's get rid of the tension. Let's get rid of the showing off with cameras. Let's disappear. But get rid of the tension. Another part of the tension comes from your inability to effectively react to a particular instant in a situation that you want to react to. Your finger can't keep up with your brain. Why is that? Because you don't practice. Practice? People say practice? Yeah, try this out. You see another photographer on the road someplace, on the street, you know, you go up to him and say, hey, how are you getting, you know, let's be friends, how are you doing? Yeah, what's your practice schedule like? How, you know, how do you do for practice? And the guy will look at you like you're nuts. There's no practice. There's practice in basketball. There's practice in golf. There's practice in dancing. There's practice in arithmetic. But there's no practicing in photography. That's amazing. We'll just, we'll just go out and do it. Just, we'll just go out and do it. Yeah, but you're missing every shot. Your brain tells you to push the button, and you're way off. You're still focusing. You still haven't figured out the framing, and you don't even know how to operate the camera. You want to have fun with photography? It's when you get the shots, when your brain tells you, and you instantly push the button, and you're ready, and you're flowing, and you're a part of the crowd. You're a part of the subject, and you're so damn happy about doing this because you're allowed to. You have this tremendous and wonderful responsibility on your shoulders now when you decided to be an effective documentary photographer. And the purpose, to create a photograph that can be understood and admired by all people. And it has the power and the thought from the photographer in the photograph that provides an emotional response to the viewer for having seen that. And the viewer wants to see it again and again and again because it's therapy and he wants to put it up on his wall and he wants to share it with his friends. But he can bring it from his brain at any time he wants, like an old song when he was 16. And it will stay with him for the rest of the life. And because of your dedication and your love and practice, you have provided a wonderful testament, a wonderful document that people all over the world can share. I'm overexposing by a couple of stops just so I have information in the shadows. This is very difficult light to work in, but street photographers really don't care about which light to work in. They work whatever light is there, and they make the best of it. Sometimes we sacrifice quality, get a faster film. So we're looking for gestures, or we're looking for something like that, too. Look at a brand new car. Empty street. Take advantage of the empty street. The gesture. The finger. Another gesture. Beautiful. Oh, well, it's not beautiful. I took it. How can it be beautiful? It's a start, though. Now, well, how can I change it? I've got that. But the situation changes. Maybe I can get closer and make believe I'm interested in something over there so I don't disturb. The mother's hand. I think I should get back a little farther. I've got that one. Let's see what it looks like from back here, if it's still going on. But you see how quickly subject presents itself? Use the emptiness. I, maybe I should have gotten that bicycle as it went by, but I didn't. The little car. Beautiful touching scene. There is subject everywhere, but don't let it go. You've got those shots, but keep working. Maybe even making contact with the subject. Does somebody have a brand new car? No. Um, <laughs> oh boy, isn't that beautiful? I bet it's got a horn too. Huh? Oh yeah, you got a horn, right? <laughs> Showing you horn? Oh, that brings back memories. Yeah. That's wonderful. Have a wonderful day.
Nobody gets hurt. What a joy of life. My gosh, how does it get any better than that? Where did that come from? Did you arrange that? <laughs> Many people tell me that when they're doing street photography and they have to get in close to subjects that they feel uncomfortable about this. They feel embarrassed or getting close to strangers or concerned that they're invading someone's privacy or they're stealing photos from somebody or they're causing a disturbance or they look like a fool. Yes, I'm uncomfortable with it a lot of times too. But I truly believe in what I'm doing and that what I am doing is a noble thing. That's what my plan is. My plan is to make photographs that entertain or educate or emotionally move in some way everyone who looks at the photograph. Like a visual poem, I'm trying to show ordinary life situations in a different way, in an exciting and unusual way that may reach people's hearts. To emotionally move, to give somebody something, some life, some hope through a camera, which requires us to look at society and look at our normal surroundings and pick out things that are happening that we react to and that we can photograph in a certain way to spread these visual poems to others. Now, if we all felt that way about what we're doing in that manner, we'd feel good about ourselves. We wouldn't feel embarrassed. You have to equate yourself to different trades, to different things. For instance, the doctor. He feels very uncomfortable body close to people. He goes out for a, he goes to look at some old person who's sick and dying, and he has to get in there and get very close and personal. He doesn't know this person, but he does it. He does it because he knows he has to. The doctor knows how important this treatment is, how important it is to get close. And he doesn't feel embarrassment because he knows he has to do it for the sake of the patient. The same way the photographer sees something happen. Maybe it's of a photojournalistic nature. He knows it's an important situation. An important situation that is run through his psyche, through his brain, his emotions, and comes out through the camera because of the way he's adjusted the camera and pointed it at a certain spot but not felt bad about what they were doing, feeling good about the prospect of this photograph meaning so much to people all over the world, that the slight 30-second discomfort you took while taking the photograph goes away after a while. You don't have to think about that because the picture came out so good. You're not invading privacy. You're not invading someone's life. You're not stealing the photographs from them. I want you to have fun. I want you to have purpose. I want you to feel important about what you're doing. I want you to get in there. And you see, the poet can do all this. The poet doesn't have the discomfort of having to get close to someone's lives. The poet is at his desk writing. But the object is the same. To produce a document that instills hope and passion in people that read it. And likewise, the photograph that does the same. The musician does the same, not feeling embarrassed but doing good work and resolving in your brain that you are doing a noble thing, a happy, a wonderful thing. And with that realization, you knew that the people that you were around, the people that you, that you thought you were disturbing, if they knew what you were doing, they would hug you, they would love you for it, that you're trying to make sense out of all this, that you're trying to show people our lives, that they may learn about their lives. The old machine gun approach to photography Ah, this has been a big problem in my life, I can tell you that right now. At night, I toss and turn in my bed. Did I take enough shots? Should I slow down and not take too many shots? Or did I take a lot of shots and maybe I'll get something? Terrible question. Back and forth, back and forth. Now, I also work with my son. He's 40 years old. He's been taking pictures for over 20 years and we've been working together as instructors, doing the workshops. We go out, we photograph together and we have the wonderful opportunity to be able to argue back and forth and discuss photography. We each look at each other's prints and we give feedback. That's a very valuable thing that we have and most people don't have that. It's a shame. And we talk about frequency. He says that I'm stiff. Stiff with the camera. You know, I'm not shooting enough. And I have nightmares, like I said, at night 
of being shooting too much and missing it, guessing. I don't want to guess. See, guessing is, is really bad for me because all my life as a photographer, I've studied and studied and tried to go by the principles set down by Brisson and Frank and Smith and people like that. You don't use the machine gun approach to photography. This is what they said. They said that. Even Ansel Adams said that. You can look it up. You're guessing. I'm so afraid of guessing because I, when I approach a shot, it's like the five Fs. I find a shot. Then I have to figure the shot. I turn away usually from the center of interest. After I identify the center of interest, I look away. I know the center of interest isn't going anywhere. It's going to be there. Now I have to look all around for the important details, elements, and factors that are present in every subject area, even if it's out in the middle of a desert, all right? So I'm working my tail off on this shot. I'm not just throwing the camera around. Oh, shot here, bam. Oh, shot this. Oh, and there he is out there. Click, 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 and maybe I'll get something. Click, click, click. Give the camera to a monkey. You give the camera to a monkey and let him take 10,000 shots, you're gonna have something. I don't want that. Because if I did that, it wasn't my shot. It was the monkey shot. I had no control over it when I go click, I click, and click, I click. How much did I concentrate on that shot? Now there are photographers that do that. But I can't do that. I don't wanna do any guessing. I wanna work my tail off for each shot. What are the elements and factors involved? Okay, we got this here, and we got this here, and we got the subject matter here, the center of interest here. All right, well, how much of this? Uh, we got the center of interest. That's the main thing we want to emphasize, okay? Now we got this detail here. See, it's the front end of a car, or it's a whole car. And over here, we got a, pu a mud puddle, okay? So if we include all of the mud puddle in the whole car, that makes the center of interest too small. Now, to make the center of interest closer, to get closer to the center of interest and make it larger, we can do that if we cut the mud puddle in half and we cut the car in half. That's fine because now we still got a mud puddle, the viewer will see that it is a mud puddle, and we still got half the car so the viewer will identify that as a car if that's what we feel is important in the shot, but we've made the center of interest bigger, see, by getting close, by moving the camera around. And maybe there's a trash can over here or something that's distracting, we can move the camera away from that. We still have the mud puddle, we still have the car, and we still have the center of interest. So this is all brain work, constant and fast brain work, because we're photographing in real time. We have to do, get these gears spinning around in our head. There's no time for going click, 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 and take the terrible chance, the nightmare possibility that we'll miss the shot because we're not looking through the viewfinder and we're not trying hard enough and we're shooting so fast that we don't see the various details and elements and factors that will give the center of interest strength if they're incorporated into the photograph correctly and effectively. So the machine gun approach, I don't get it, you know? I know this is a guy from New York, Gary, you know? I love you, Gary. But he said, you, what, do you take 10, shot, 10 rolls a day to stay in shape? I mean, come on. Uh, he died and he had 10,000 rolls of film that hadn't even been processed in his apartment or something like that, I don't know. And that's fine, and he, got, he was a wonderful photographer. He got some wonderful shots. But what was his shot? miss ratio street photography has its own set of problems as against documentary photography much much different in street photography you're dealing with people that are not prepared to see you at all you are the standout especially if you have a bag and you've got the menacing camera or you're trying to hide it or you're standing out or you're frowning like most of us do when we're trying to concentrate you can't do that in street photography without getting in trouble, I find. So you have to soften it up a little bit and you have to meet the conditions and bend with the conditions. These people perceive a photographer with a bag and a sneaky look and a big camera. They perceive them badly. And you can get into big trouble if there's an argument here and there's a lot of people around. So you keep a low profile like me. I'm an old man whose doctor told me to get exercise and take up a hobby. I got the shoes, just the one camera, I got a couple of rolls of film in my pocket, I got my notebook, and I'm walking around, presumably on my day off or I'm retired. I'm no threat to anybody. I got a painted on smile all day. I'm very enthusiastic. I look like a guy who's on vacation having a great time. And everybody likes to see somebody like that. So I don't get in trouble. Plus, 
I'm prepared for just about any scenario that happens to me. If someone runs up and says, hey, you take my picture, I'm ready for him. I can throw him right to the ground with words. No problem at all. I just prepare myself for any kind of a scenario that's happened to me over 45 years. You know, oh yeah, I used to live in this neighborhood. Is that the same store? Is that, that was that bad? You know, and you take over the conversation. But it's nicely, you're doing it nicely and you're a little bit nutty, maybe even a little bit drunk. But you're softening the situations. Okay, I'm just getting ready to go out for a walk with the cameras, and see if I can make something happen. And what it really is, and what I really enjoy about doing this, is that I know that I'm going to go to a different place. Not just a different location, but a different place in my mind. A typical walk down the street isn't the same for me when I've got the cameras. I'm going into a different dimension of thought different dimension of intention of what I'm going to do. I'm not just going for a walk, although that's what I'm doing. I'm going for a walk to look for situations and it's very difficult. And we must go into the different dimension. Just as a painter goes into a different dimension when he's working on a painting. What is he thinking about? What is the poet thinking about? What is the musician thinking about? We're in a different dimension, a different thought pattern. We're looking around for possibilities that when combined with our walking and our knowledge in our heart, we can assemble. And I don't mean change or arrange things. I mean assemble them by moving our position relative to the subject. And with timing, waiting for that person to walk by. Are you going to have the whole person in the photograph? Are you going to have just his foot coming into the photograph? Are you going to have just his foot leaving the photograph? Are you going to have just his shadow? All these things must be determined before the button is pressed. And before the button is pressed, all these other functions have to be done, the focusing and the framing accurately. Everything is very difficult, but it's in another dimension. Think of it that way. You're gonna make something out of nothing. You're gonna find something lying around. And because of your cleverness, you've been able to put it together from another dimension into the dimension of my heart and my visual understanding when I look at your photograph. So go out into that dimension, discover the world, and show it to us in a meaningful way that we can get insight, love, and understanding from your photographs. It's going to be difficult, but you're going to be like Alice going through the looking glass or down the rabbit hole. You're going to go into a wonderful world, an unbelievable world of strange things, and indeed a different dimension. Let's simplify the process of photography. You know, a lot of people say it's all about the eyes and what you see, that photographers are seers. No, no, no. I don't believe that. The eyes and seeing, they're just part of the tools that we use, like the camera and the lens, the film. It's not the eyes. Anybody can see that has eyes to see. But it's what we feel and what we get out of the heart that matters. We have to convey a passion. We have to convey an understanding. We have to convey somebody's soul under their shirt. The eyes can only help us get there by manipulating the camera and actually physically seeing it. 